All right, um, a very good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to this, our, our very first um, parent webinar. And um, what I'm hoping to achieve during this session is to, to sort of replicate the sort of uh, the, the conversations. I, I was talking to somebody the other day and um, just mentioning how at this time of the year, usually I'd be wandering around from field to field, watching all sorts of stuff going on around college. And um, parents will always draw alongside and ask a question or uh, express a concern. And um, obviously with the uh, state of play at the moment, that makes that uh, impossible. And um, so welcome to this. What I'm hoping to do, I obviously don't have all of the answers. I wish I did. But what I'm hoping to do is to just share with you all the things that we're thinking about at the moment so that you're sort of on the inside track and also to give you the opportunity to um, ask me uh, questions and if I can't um, answer them directly here, um, I would certainly uh, answer them tomorrow morning in writing so that um, it just depends how it goes. We've got a lot of people here and I don't know if I'll get through everything in the hour that we've got, but I'm hoping to um, really just go through some slides and to give you some uh, information as to what we're thinking about. And then um, as we go along, I'll explain in a second how it'll work in terms of the Q&A. Um, those are some of the topics that I'm hoping to touch on um, and really what it entails or what I'm hoping to cover is right from the very basics of sort of keeping the school running under these circumstances and importantly, making sure that your boys are, are learning stuff and will be prepared um, and have lost uh, the absolute bare minimum of academic time by the time all of this is finished. But also, um, you'll see there's an item there about extramurals and that's not just about sports and stuff, it's about actual wellness and their, their, their mental state. So I'll go through all of those in turn and that's just the, the slides here tonight are really just to sort of prompt me so I remember to say all the stuff that I want to. Um, and uh, I'm really hoping that this is going to work and I've been doing an online course myself. I'm teaching grade 8 chemistry this uh, term and I've been doing my own online course during the break. And one of the things that's worked really well was when the, the speaker is, is talking all the time, it's quite hard for them to keep track of all the questions and things that are popping up in the Q&A box. And so you'll see Graham Holmes uh, sitting uh, on the side here. And the reason uh, Graham is here is that he's, he's scanning through those, um, he's scanning through those Q&A questions uh, his job is to interrupt me when he needs to, so he'll just unmute himself and interrupt me if he needs to, if there's something that I've skipped over and it's the right time to ask the question, or he'll be grouping things. He'll, he'll interrupt me and say, stop, you know, five people have asked me this question. Um, you know, maybe this is a good time to answer it. So uh, Graham's there, and um, I, I, I don't think there's anybody better qualified than Graham. He is an old boy himself. He is a father of three boys, two of whom have been through the school and one who is um, in the school at the moment. So I think he's well known and uh, he's a, a good old Andrian. I, I referred to him as an old dog the other day, but he didn't, uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't, uh, didn't uh, mind it. it uh, and uh, I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping this is going to work, but really it is an experiment and we ask your forgiveness if it doesn't, but I, I actually think it, it might. And um, right at the very end, I give you my email address, I give you my WhatsApp uh, number. So I'm very happy to get feedback as to uh, how you think we can improve these sorts of things. Really, um, I firmly believe, and I, I, I know I say this all the time, but uh, our school isn't just a school, it is a community. And I, I pick up on that a little bit later. So um, for that reason, um, I'm, I, obviously, I need to talk to staff all the time and boys, but parents are a, a very important group and I, I really would want you to feel that you, I, I don't have the answers, I'm not going to give you the answers or make big announcements or anything like that tonight, but I want you to feel that you're on the inside track. And uh, that's hopefully uh, where we're going. So um, just in terms of the online learning program, um, I speak to you as a father who has two children who are doing this online stuff and it's not... It's not as easy um, from a parental side to get all those structures in place. So I can feel the, the um, uh, tensions and the, 
the experiences you're going through. Um, I'm also teaching a grade eight chemistry class this term and coming to terms with having to try and teach a, a really um, hands-on um, subject uh, via um, online. And so um, there's some challenges there. And obviously every week we get feedback from all of the staff on how the online program is going. Uh, what I'm really anxious about is that we don't end up three or four weeks into something and then we pick up on the fact that there's a problem. And so we've built into our review processes a whole lot of mentorship and uh, processes of revising how the week has gone and how we're doing and who's there and who's not there. And so if it seems like the process is a little bit more um, and anxious, I suppose, it's because we, the, the risk of this online stuff is that you can get uh, some way down the line and you can end up not knowing who's on the bus and who's off the bus. And once you're off the bus, under these circumstances, it's quite hard to come back to speed. So, so that's what we're working on. I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that um, we've managed to adapt our program. And I think as um, online, uh, online learning goes, I think we have a really, really good product. I'm confident that every child who goes uh, along with the program will get to the end of this and feel that they know the stuff they need to know when they're writing tests and writing exams. And it, um, obviously our key thinking is around the main gateway exams. We're pretty sure that um, the students who, all of our students, but particularly the ones who need to prepare for those gateway exams, we don't know what those look like. But what we do know is that we've had uh, feedback from Umalusi, who is the monitoring uh, agency, government monitoring, monitoring agency for uh, the matric process. And they're saying they're not, they're not looking to a trimmed down matric as a solution to this. They, they don't want um, academic content just trimmed to fit. Um, so we're going to have to adapt our program to make sure that all the work gets covered. And we do that, of course, knowing that although we're, we're well um, equipped and well versed in online, uh, the real agenda will be set by um, the fact that um, most schools are not. And so um, it, it, it's an open, open discussion as to how it's all going to uh, work out in the end. But um, if it works to the, to, to the requirement that our boys write a, a full-on matric, um, we're confident that they'll be ready for the matric and, of course, the Cambridge A-levels. So that's some of the online stuff and some of our thinking around the online work. Um, Aidan Smith and Petra Gens and a whole team of people are doing phenomenal work on that. And uh, we, we'd be really interested to, to hear from parents as to what their experiences are. Just getting back to my anecdote around uh, standing around the rugby field, I can't count the number of times parents have sort of come to me or written to me and said, you know, if my son finds out I'm talking to you, he's going to kill me. Please don't tell him I spoke to you. Um, I think these circumstances are such that um, communication is really what's going to get us through this difficult time. And they're difficult things to talk about. So um, please don't feel you know, either that uh, there's going to be repercussions or there's going to be um, problems. We really, uh, there are no answers to this. There's no right and wrong. And we're hoping that we will have made all the right choices incrementally by the time we get to the end of this, that um, we've got something really good to talk about at the end of it. And um, on the online program, you'll see we've we've put quite a bit of effort this term into creating something of an extramural program as best we can um, with the online um, resources that we have. And that's not, that's not just for fun, and it's not just because it's fun to watch boys doing challenges and sport challenges and things. There's a, a lot of thinking that's gone into that. One of it is that, you know, we, we mustn't, we ourselves as the adults in this conversation have had, um, I mean, we're experiencing a, a huge amount of stress and a whole lot of thinking that we didn't think we would have to uh, deal with. But we mustn't underestimate the, the effect that all of this is having on, on our boys, on their sense of detachment from each other, their sense of stress of a sudden departure from school. Um, they're, they're struggling to get um, into the, the new routine of, um, of, of online learning and wondering, you know, what's it going to look like, having all the stress of all the economic data that's flooding their heads. 
So there's a lot going on in their little heads. And what we're trying to do in our extramural uh, program is to get them engaging with each other and engaging in tutor groups and engaging in um, the normal sort of combinations of groups that they would. But also having a sense of belonging, a sense of engagement, and of course, getting the, keeping them fit, keeping them healthy and keeping them outdoors as much as we can, um, because we know the importance of activity in a teenage boy's life, that sort of physical activity and, you know, the, that sort of a response of um, staying in bed till 12 and flumping around and um, that sense of demotivation that comes when they're deprived of that. We're quite anxious to avoid that. So our extramurals are not there just for fun. Um, and we hope they will be fun, but they're there actually for what we think is a really important purpose. And we do ask, therefore, that uh, you, you support them uh, from, from your side. And, and again, just on that, it's not just sport. It's getting our musicians opportunity to practice for something and do it so that they get that sense of having accomplished something that it's not just sitting with an instrument and getting nowhere with it. Um, it's getting opportunities for our various debating and all that sort of stuff to happen so that there is that sense of, of making some sort of progress uh, under some very difficult circumstances. One of the other things we've been, uh, Graham, just I'll pause there. Um, um, are you happy for me to prattle on or do you have any questions on what I've been uh, saying? Yeah, Ellen, I think carry on. One I'd just like to deal with up front, um, coming from Chris Cowan. He asks the question about the presentation is being recorded. So can the slides and the audio be made available to parents or spouses that are not able to attend this live session? Yes, so um, that's why we've recorded it. Uh, this is, uh, we'll figure out a way, we'll do a, um, probably a, a YouTube link or something like that. Um, it's not the sort of thing we'd put onto, onto our Facebook sharing like we did with Assembly, but yes, the answer is yes. I think just carry on, you know, there are other questions, but I, I think they may come out during the course of your discussion. Okay, perfect, thank you. So um, obviously uh, during this time, in getting ready and there obviously there is a vagueness um, as to when schools will be able to open and all of the variables around borders and transport and other risk factors um, but what we've done is we've worked with what we know and we've consulted widely so <clears throat> we have a group of of doctors who um, are within our community around the country who formed a a committee that have been advising us in terms of some of the, the important medical things that we need to do. We'd like to, when, when parents are ready to send their sons back here, we'd like to be able to assure them, and in fact, we've got a whole pack that we would send them as to this is what we're going to be doing and this is how we're going to be doing it. And um, so we've been buying all the right equipment, right down from face masks for the boys and the staff to working out how do you launder face masks and all that sort of stuff, um, working out important protocols, um, back to school protocols, back to boarding protocols, uh, medical protocols. Uh, there's a whole um, booklet of them, which, is, which when we say to parents, we're ready for your son to come back, they'll be able to read through all of that and say, we like what we see um, and we're ready to send our boy back. So that's all in place, getting the sand ready and um, sand quarantine and isolation all go together because in fact, what we're trying to do is to keep the sand as a completely clean space. So uh, there'll be no COVID type business conducted in the sand. Um, we've um, identified places where we would uh, quarantine uh, boys, where we would isolate boys who are showing symptoms prior to a test and a separate place where we would isolate boys uh, post-test and um, a whole protocol around how we do that. And it's quite complex and uh, it's one of the big challenges that we actually are dealing with. Um, looking at a risk analysis, so we don't want to um, just say, uh, you, you will see, and I, I, if you follow the, the press, you will see some fairly bold statements of schools just saying, yeah, we're open for business. Uh, we want to be a bit more scientific than that. We want to say we've considered these risks. Here's our risk analysis. This is on the basis that we're making the decision. And so um, 
uh, a risk analysis that obviously is shared with DSG so that we're both thinking along the same lines. It'd be very odd if we dismissed a risk that was a big risk for DSG. It'd mean one of us is right and one of us is wrong. So we need to make sure that uh, we've thought together with DSG. And um, so obviously each week we have a, a, meet, a whole series of meetings internally at St Andrews and then a whole series of meetings where we share what we know with DSG and DSG share what they know with us. And there's been a lot of uh, learning uh, across uh, those two uh, boundaries. Um, so although the wall, the, the wall is closed and even in the first weeks as we reintegrate students, the wall is still going to stay closed, um, in, in terms of sharing it's very much open. And obviously this is something we would have had to think about um, even if even if there were no um, chaos in the aviation industry as related to COVID, because in fact, um, the demise or, or the apparent demise or, or the very um, uh, dubious state of South African Airways and its associated um, uh, businesses uh, have already raised flags for us in terms of getting boys to Grahamstown and getting boys away from Grahamstown. You don't want to get them here and they can't get back again. So um, we've done a lot of thinking around this and I can't give definitive answers, but some of the things we're talking about include charter planes and for an initial return to Grahamstown, we've got, I think, some fairly exciting possibilities around charter planes and there are a small charter plane of less than 20 people can land in Grahamstown, but obviously the cost of flying a small charter plane is prohibitive. Um, so we, we're exploring options of, say for example, flying a bigger charter from Lanseria Airport, for example, to PE Airport. The charter terminals in both of those airports are pretty clean and, and uh, relatively um, unpopulated, and so we see that as quite a, a safe way to get boys to school and we're looking at, at our various options there. We've uh, talked to some uh, really interesting um, friends of college who are involved in that industry. So um, we're getting some ideas there. But also, of course, um, going back to good old basics, uh, sending a, a sanitized Blunden's bus up to Cape Town or Johannesburg or Nasna or Plett or any of those places. And a travel day then does become literally a travel day. But um, under the circumstances, um, we, we think it's very cost effective and it's a way of getting our boys back. And um, we obviously would uh, have to give them a bit, of, bit more time to recuperate. And I'll talk about um, what they would do in preparation before they return so that um, the, the, the travel back to school is a whole separate slide on that. So obviously, Government is quiet about this at the moment, and there's been a whole lot of toing and froing, and there have been some schools that have been really um, excited and said, we're opening on the 18th, come what may, and then the government's had to say, listen, you can't do that, you can't say that. So we haven't announced when we're going to be open, and if you remember back to that first letter we sent, uh, we said that we'd give people two weeks' notice as to when we're ready to open so that um, they're able to prepare and to uh, take all the necessary steps. So this first scenario is the very, very early stages. If you can imagine um, government announcing that schools can open, but we're still in the process of getting our boarding uh, protocols and travel and all that ready. So we would have a situation where we've got restrictive um, uh, structures in terms of lockdown. So cross-border travel, travel might be an issue across um, province um, uh, travel might be an issue. So we can't just throw our school open and say we're open. So uh, we envisage a scene where schools have been declared open, but boarding is closed. And obviously we only have a handful of students and therefore um, the, our ability to, look, to deliver classroom stuff is, um, is restricted. So, what we envisage there is a situation where people who are resident in Makanda or Grahamstown are able to come in to school. Uh, we'd work out ways possibly to open uh, some key facilities and to have those properly resourced so that people who need the data, who need the um, con connectivity are able to do so, come and do a run, some laps around the, the, the field and uh, you know all of that in, in 
with all the right protocols. We have, we have a protocol that we've developed for that, that has all the distancing and the, the sanitizing and the various uh, things in place. And although we talk about it as a day work program, um, we have had some questions from people who don't live in Grahamstown who've said, we own a house in Grahamstown, what if we, um, what if we moved to Grahamstown or what if our son came back to Grahamstown and uh, stayed in our house? And we see that as part of our program. If people who, who, for one reason or another, want to be part of that. But we do see this as a fairly um, short-term, intermediate sort of step, because our objective is to move to uh, a scenario where, our, where we're ready to say that we're open for for for. Um, for borders and we open for academic classes and of course that again is a phased process so and there are two things one important consideration is that a government declaration that schools are ready to be opened is not necessarily the right thing for your and my son uh, we need to be sure that they're going to derive value by being back at school that they're not just coming here to sit in a room and do online learning as if they were sitting at home so there has to be some sort of value add that that um, that makes it worthwhile to come back, and of course we need to have we need to be sure that our risk analysis has been really thought through and that we're not rushing boys back just so that we can say that we're open. And there's a balance between meeting the uh, we know the boys want to be back, we know the staff are desperate to be back, and we are ourselves desperate to be back. Um, we don't want to to rush that. Um, in, a, in a quick sort of unthought through process. And at the same time, we don't want to suffocate the whole process by overthinking stuff. But we do want to be able to say that here's our consideration of risk and we know that this is what we can do. And we feel confident that um, uh, there is some value to being back on campus. And this is how we see that value looking. We see uh, initially, it's unlikely that we could say, on date X, all boys can return to school and we're having on-campus lessons as per the good old days. Um, that's unlikely because of uh, the, the fact that some provincial borders might stay closed and certainly some national borders might stay closed and different national borders will open at different times. So um, it, in terms of getting all of our boys back, we have to be able to cater for the fact that we have some on campus and some away from school. And so we see a, a, a phase of blended learning where we have classrooms available, we have the classes um, uh, in terms of all the, the distancing and sanitized conditions and all the protocols, the screening, the testing and all that sort of stuff going on. Um, we keep our online backbone running and we have tutorial sessions in person for those who are here. And um, for those who are away, we have those uh, tutorial sessions screened via Zoom, something pretty much like this. This is all um, still work in progress, but a lot of thinking is going into it. And in the same way that um, we, 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 we have managed to transition to this new way of, of teaching, we're pretty confident that we've got a, a good um, option here. And we will reach a stage where we're able to say, right, everybody's back on campus and we're now back to, back to how we would uh, normally offer in-campus in classes. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of where we're heading in our thinking and a lot of work is going into that across uh, DSG and St Andrews. Then um, obviously in terms of that, we have to have a whole lot of protocols in place. We have to have a boarding protocol, which we've got, and I think we've got a really um, well-advanced document that we're almost ready to share. Um, in terms of academic content, uh, contact, it's really just around screening and PPE and uh, sanitizing, and then the, the medical protocols. And the, the thing I put there in yellow about a readmission pack, it sounds uh, pretty dramatic, but really what it is, is that we provide you all of these documents uh, so that you're able to see what you are sending your son back to, so that you're confident that uh, he would be getting the best possible care under the circumstances. And of course, um, as you know, in this um, 
in this environment, it's a, a rapidly changing um, landscape. And so we review these things every week. Uh, the protocols that we developed last week on Tuesday, we're reviewing tomorrow. And um, already there's a whole lot of it that's obsolete, out of date. There's a whole lot of new information that's come into it. So um, as we share these things, we would also um, be receiving comment from parents as well. Um, so it's not just a here's your pack, take it and like it. You know, it's a continual feedback process. And um, those are some of the documents that we're working on. Um, and they have a lot of work's gone into them. Uh, just the bottom two are of interest because obviously one of the one of the questions that because we're in such a state of uncertainty is what happens when boys get back to school and they've sort of managed the online stuff, but when they when they begin engaging in the in the um, the real classroom stuff, their gaps and things. So as we stand, we're pretty confident in terms of the quality of the online uh, course. We're very confident in our ability to follow up with boys and to make sure that they are um, on track and keeping up and we're testing them and they're learning in the right sort of ways. But you never know until you know. And it might be that we get to a stage where we say, uh, in order to get these boys properly prepared for whatever the exam is going to look like, we need some extra time. And so, um, Aidan Smith has worked through a revised um, year calendar or term calendar and when we know what the what the minister says and what the lockdown conditions say we, we've got something we're ready to run with that will either be able to say we're happy with where we are or we need some more time and obviously uh, the half term and uh, the August holidays are the things that we're looking at and we're looking at them carefully also we don't want boys to come back to school and be here for two weeks and then go on half term because that's just where the, the timetable has left us. And we don't want them to be here for four weeks and then have a five week holiday. So it's really just um, looking at, at, at all of those sort of permutations. And then one of the things that we would also want is when we distribute our um, medical uh, framework, it, it tells you step by step what will happen to a boy who presents with symptoms or a boy who's been in contact. We, we work on the assumption that um, this is not going to go away in, in the immediate future. We will have boys who fall sick. Some will fall sick with flu, some will fall sick with other things, some will fall sick possibly with COVID-19. And um, we, we want to have a, a protocol that, com that, that leaves um, parents happy that uh, if, we, if we're treating them here, this is how we're going to do it. Um, but also, um, we want them, we want parents when they send their boys here to send them with a clear set of guidelines so that if we need to get boys home quickly, we're able to do so. We know who we can contact if, if they're coming from far, who can we contact that's local that can stand in um, just so that um, we're not, we're not um, st uh, uh, clutching around to try to figure these things out uh, if things. Uh, happen sometime down in the future. So those are some of the things that we we are um, working on. And then just, Graham? Alan, maybe just a brief, um, just sort of summary of where we are. And, you know, questions are coming in quite thick and fast. Yeah. There, there are three main areas that people are asking questions on. The first one is the whole online learning environment and specifically if there are children that are battling, you know, is, you know, can there be more regular feedback? Are you confident with the whole online learning environment? And I think you've covered that reasonably well. I think it's just that one issue about, you know, if they're concerned about specific kids. And the second thing is very much around when are, when, when are the schools going to open? When is the school going to open? When are children going to come back? Um, and then very specifically, and Alan, I think you're probably going to need to deal with this one as a completely separate issue. It's uh, people that are outside of the borders of South Africa, and every single case is going to be different. There's one about Australia and Botswana, and, you know, so those are, you know, both the question about when borders are open, and also when, um, you know, 
airplanes being available and that kind of thing. So that probably has to be um, dealt quite um, differently. Um, and then obviously there's the whole question about the protocols when the children do come back um, and how those all fit together. Um, something quite interesting that this whole question coming up is, you know, would the school ask parents if they prepared to let their children come back? Um, you know, if there are parents that are particularly concerned about risk, um, sort of related to that, I guess, is one question coming through and saying, well, you know, children are at such low risk anyway, you know, sh shouldn't they be coming back? But I guess that the two things that I've just said, you know, demonstrates that there are some people on one extreme are saying, send the kids back. And there are others on the other extreme saying, hang on, I've got potentially got some concerns. So, Alan, I think it was those three big things that um, have been the main questions so far. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll quickly touch on them. And um, uh, in my notes, I turned your three to five. So I'll just quickly um, go back on them. So in terms of online and feedback and how are people doing, um, it's really important to us. So we, we have contact with the boys and we will know who's not turning up for lessons and we will know who's not submitting work. But we don't necessarily know, in the same way, if a boy is sitting in class and he has got no idea what you're talking about, he is able to um, ask quickly there and then. And if you get him through that step, he's able to progress. And that's one, you know, that's one of the drawbacks of this system, but it's not, it's not insurmountable. And so I would really encourage parents to, to firstly keep an ear, have those conversations with your boys as to how it's going. Um, and there are a number of mechanisms. If, if it is just that you want to raise a uh, concern that your son is drowning in maths and um, use the, the, the channel that you would normally use and that's make contact with the housemasters. And they are, they've been briefed, they're ready and waiting. And although they're not, they're not, the, um, they're not there as, a, as an academic um, guide, it's not that, Mr. Jackson's going to give an extra maths lesson, but certainly he would be able to, in the same way that if the boy in, in, in Upper went to Mr. Jackson and said, listen, I'm, I'm drowning in maths, he'd be able to make contact with the maths teacher and make sure that the maths teacher knew that there was an, an issue. So that's the one um, uh, possibility. And the other possibility is encouraging your, your son to write to the teacher uh, through, um, some of the, I mean, there are all sorts of private ways in Google Classroom that boys can either email or speak to the teacher directly and just to ask those questions. And I think that's the role that we as parents have to take in that, you know, the teacher will, will assume in the absence of all knowledge that everything is fine. And if we, if we, if we take it upon ourselves just to alert them to the fact, you know, can we, can we just have a, a, a quick session on Zoom just to ask some direct questions. Uh, I think that would be really valuable. So um, the, the, the we, 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 we are relying on people to, to draw to our attention and your, your route is the housemaster. It's direct contact with the teacher. Uh, the boys are in contact with their tutors and, and uh, uh, parents who contacted the tutor directly um, and we've had some of those, and it's been resolved quite well. So, so that's um, uh, the first question. In terms of when are we going to come back, uh, that's a, uh, an open question. We are um, told that the minister is going to speak to us somewhere around the 18th of May, and we are told that the minister is going to think about um, whether the 1st of June is an appropriate time to... I uh, have a, a back to school sort of day. Um, how that's going to be phased, we're not entirely sure, but obviously the, what's been spoken a lot about is phasing it from matric down. We've had some conversations around what the phasing would look like, and obviously it's important to get our matric boys back. So uh, we'd certainly start with uh, the matric group. The prep schools are a completely separate uh, conversation because we've got a lot of 
um, day scholars at the prep and um, they could phase their age grouping much more concurrently than we could. But at the same time, um, we are um, also exploring, you know, we, we realize that not everybody can come back because of that sort of um, border crossings and all those sorts of other issues, parents perhaps not wanting to send them back at that particular stage. So we're looking at, at ways of different age groups coming back concurrently. Um, so it doesn't have to be that all the grade 10s come back on a date and all the grade nines come back on a date. But certainly we regard grade 11 as very important because the, the marks grade 11s are getting are of really important value for their university applications. Grade 12 is very important for obvious reasons. So we'd start there and in our previous correspondence, we've said we'd give two weeks notice. And one of the, um, one of the reasons for that is that when we give our two week notice, it's so that parents can begin uh, isolating their sons in the right sort of way. Not that because of lockdown, not that they've been out and about, but just so that uh, when they fill in their screening um, document to come back, they're able to say he hasn't been in contact with anybody who has tested this or that or um, so we are um, we're waiting to hear from the minister and I'm told that the minister is going to talk to us on Thursday so we'll we'll know more and we'll communicate uh, frequently and often around that as soon as we know but the minister's declaration is one thing our risk analysis is another thing and in terms of those people outside of South Africa what do they do um, the reason why we've we've worked hard at a, at keeping the online backbone as our academic framework uh, is exactly for that reason. So that people, we, we know that not everybody can come back to school at the same time. So the, the people who for any reason, and, and that could be parents who are not yet ready for their sons to come back, they just want to see how it goes and they've got to hold, hold on and just check that everything's fine. So we will have presented all of our protocols to parents and um, they will see how it all works out. They'll make an informed decision based on that and either they'll send their sons or they won't. If they don't send their sons, um, if they don't send their sons, they would be able to uh, carry on as normal through the um, online process. And in that online process, they'd be able to tune into the tutorial sessions and um, be able to uh, keep in touch that way. So there is a messy middle bit where some are here and some are not here. And I don't think is any way we can get around that. So keep your questions coming. And then um, obviously what we would want to manage, we, we, we so recognize the role that sports plays in the life of the school. And we know that the boys are desperate to come back and have a, a good um, sporting year. And that they are heartbroken at the fact that uh, they, they're not having all these uh, games and things, as are we actually. But um, obviously, we need to be. In, we need. It, it would be um, irresponsible of us if we if we pretended that uh, everything is just back to normal. Come back, and we're going to have rugby against Gray. Um, so, we we we're working hard to make sure that there is sport for them to come back to, but um, and lots of fitness and lots of conditioning and some of the best stuff that Lawrence Christie can put into getting boys ready for whatever university or post school rugby or hockey they're going to be playing. Um, but it's, it, again, sport itself is a phased process. And right the way through this, our attitude has been that we've got to be prepared for the very worst. But at the same time, in the back of our heads, we've also got to be prepared for the very best. So, um, and, and so making sure that we don't prematurely cancel things and but at the same time, we don't rush into them knee-jerk, you know, we're going to suddenly manufacture a game against Kingswood just so we can. Um, so it's making sure that in, in things like tennis and other non-contact sports that you can play out and open, those are easy ones to strategize around. But uh, a lot of thinking going into our sport to make sure that there is a value add. I mean, if boys are coming back here, they must be uh, out and about uh, getting fresh air and... Um, enjoying as much as they can of what they what they love. And I've mentioned this, so I won't dwell on it, but in terms of our protocols, we do go into a lot of depth around how we quarantine, where we quarantine, where we isolate, how we isolate, and how we divide the two. And that will be sent to parents so that um, 
when they're deciding are they ready or not, that's what they're basing it on. And then obviously over time, we don't know, um, lockdown go backwards or forwards, we don't know how it's uh, all gonna play out, but um, we, we have a good team locally who guide us along in terms of national guidelines and international for that matter. It's a panel of doctors who are part of our parent body who would be sending their own children into this environment. Um, and of course, uh, we, we're in everything that we do, when we have all of our meetings, it's not what we think. We keep saying this has to be based on some sort of expert view and who are the experts. And um, uh, so as we relax, it's not just we think, oh, well, it's going well. Uh, we'll take expert advice and consult right the way through. And this is a, a tricky one, and uh, it might generate lots of questions that I might not be able to answer all. But really, what you would have you would have received the letter that came from all of the heads and the chairs of council, and what that really is based on is that this is a, a, an ecosystem and a, a genuine sort of community, and we would hate to get to the end of this and say. St. Andrews has looked after its own finances and we've, um, we've come out of this fine. Uh, we felt no pain. Uh, and at the same time, parents are sitting on the other side and saying, look at the pain that we've experienced having to pay uh, to continue uh, in terms of paying fees. And so we are acutely aware of what our community is going through. And we're acutely aware of how we rely upon them and they rely upon us and that it's a, a genuine sort of ecosystem. And, so that, those principles of um, finding savings where we can, sacrificing where we can, and crediting back to parents is a really important principle. And I think we've spent hours and hours together with DSG and PrEP and DSG Junior crunching numbers to make sure that we're doing the right thing by everybody. And so one of the you know, the, the, the initial credit that showed on the um, fee statement uh, was a small credit because obviously that was reflecting um, the, the last few weeks of term, um, all those costs had been incurred and um, there, was, there wasn't much in terms of direct saving that we could, we could realize. The finance departments of DSG and St Andrews have been hard at work together and uh, we hope during the course of this week a letter will come out from them showing what the uh, credit uh, will be and we hope that um, parents will be able to see that we really are trying to balance the fact that we need a sustainable school for people to come back to and if we were to um, move too quickly we could end up um, sacrificing too much too soon that the school isn't ready to function. And if we move too slowly, we end up sacrificing parents. We're trying to keep that balance uh, absolutely correct. And um, for those of you who are familiar with other boys boarding schools in the country, you'll see um, they are saying, well, let's not talk about all of this sort of stuff now. We'll wait till the end of the year and we'll talk about it. Um, and we'll have summed up the net gains and losses and uh, we'll do something at the end of the year. We, we're trying to be more open, more transparent and more directly uh, accountable to our parents. Not, that, not, not, as a form of, not saying that as a form of criticism, I'm just saying we've taken the view that um, we operate in that sort of a, an environment. And, and um, that letter will come back. It will give you some idea as to where the savings and sacrifices are being made. And... And of course, um, I put that 60 month view in because really we, we would hope that when you're, when you're thinking about your son and his relationship with St. Andrews, it's not just that the last two months have been pretty tricky and uh, you know, are we getting value for money for that? Um, we, we recognize the fact that these are extraordinary uh, and very difficult times for everybody. And um, we really hope to be transparent we hope and we, we committed to um, to uh, passing back all of the savings that we can and um, making the necessary sacrifices so that at the end of this um, pain has been shared and I think there's plenty of pain going around now um, it, it's not that we're hoping to just run a, a school and at the end of it say we've 
broken even for the year and that's great. Um, there's, there's some real work going into that and the letter will be coming this week. And then um, the other thing that I mentioned is that um, we have had contact from some parents who have um, expressed a view that uh, they were um, they were in a particular position where they were ready to give back the credits that we had um, proposed and they would want to do that in the future and they'd said that a good idea would be to see you know maybe there are other parents all there's a whole spectrum of effect here and some parents who are less affected um, who would might be able to uh, give back into a fund and so Angie Mariner together with uh, Alison Binnikas at DSG side have been working on that and there will be some correspondence uh, around that and of course it's not an appeal because it's not the right environment to appeal. It's really just saying here yeah, this platform is and if, if people are willing and able, uh, it's there. And um, so this is tricky terrain. Uh, and, and really, it's my, 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 my prayer that we won't have, um, I don't know what the equivalent of an online virtual boarding school car park chatter sort of conversation is. I don't know what you'd call it, but I, I would hope that um, where there are doubts and where there are questions, just email us and, and you know, it's, um, we'd, we'd be happy to, to share as much as we can with you so that you, you're reassured of our integrity. And, and the, the process is one that, you know, it would be, be silly to be overconfident and to realize too many savings up front and then we end up in a situation uh, where we've over overshot and have to draw back and also um, if we if we realizing savings in in April remember that that that's budgeted as a holiday month and so the savings we realize in April are not the same as the savings we realize in May and of course if we realize all these savings now and then keep school back in August and there's a whole different conversation that has to go on there so all I can reassure you is that this is being spoken about a lot and our overriding principle of, of fairness and uh, a sharing um, amongst us that we make sure that we keep this as a sustainable business uh, ready for our boys to come back. That's really what we're trying to achieve in, in a really honest way. Um, so um, at the end, I've got WhatsApps and I've got um, uh, email addresses for you to contact me directly if there are any questions. Well, there they are. So, Graham, that's where I am. You've, I see you've got lots of questions far away. Yeah, look, there are lots of questions and we're certainly not get, going to get through them all and perhaps there's some that we can go through afterwards and respond individually to. Um, but while you're on the question of financial sustainability, a question came through around the sustainability of the school if a large number of boys are forced to leave the school. You know, what is the, the school's ability to, um, to sustain itself through something like that? So, I mean, it's a difficult question and I, I can't give you a glib, quick answer, but um, we, if, if it were to be that a large number of boys were forced to leave, we would have to make some hard decisions around what the school looks like. Um, will there be a school? The answer I think is an absolute yes. And um, we would just need to reshape it in order to meet the, 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 the circumstance. And we, we, we're ready to have those tough conversations. And obviously that's a, a developing story. Um, St Andrews has been through much worse than this and as stewards of this place, I know that we will get it through. And it's a school, if you look at its uh, history, it's had its ups and downs. Uh, there have been times of closing, talking about closing boarding houses and reopening boarding houses. Um, I pray and I hope we don't get to that. But when it gets to the point of having those tough decisions, um, we have to make them, the school, the school has to survive. Um, and uh, I would, yeah, that's about as much as I can that one. And, and then, Alan, um, you've been pretty clear that, you know, the school are going to have to adopt some form of phased approach when it becomes practical to come back to school. So, I mean, you know, some of the people have been saying, well, you know, overseas or out of country, uh, different grades. But, you know, it just seems to me that, 
a phased approach will have to come into it um, in some manner or form. When it will. Stores, I mean, like that. it will. And and we know what the beginning looks like, and that would certainly be matric and or grade 11. And because not everybody can come in at the same time, it might say we're open to matrix, but only half our matrix can be here. And so we can not be overwhelmed by having matric and grade 11. So um, it, it is very much a phased approach. And, um, and a, a fairly, one of the schools I'm following closely is a school that I have a friend who's the headmaster of in Germany, and they opened um, now three weeks ago. And so it's a very interesting case study. They're a boarding school in the middle of the Black Forest. So um, people have to travel to be there. And we've been following how they've managed their self-isolation and all of those protocols in terms of getting boys there. So I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping we'll have more information, you know, when, by the time we're ready to say the lights are green, we'll, well, obviously we'll know who's, who's coming, but we, um, how we will phase it, whether it's by cohort or by grade or by just who's available, who's closest, you know, all of those things are, are, are up in the air still. Okay, um, and then Alan, perhaps the question is the extent of involvement by parents in the online process of being educated that their children are going through. Um, somebody was talking about can we have access to the Guardian feature. So I guess it's the, 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 the issue is, you know, to what extent do we as parents really get involved in the online uh, education of children? Or can we just sit back and, and let um, the school play, you know, continue to, to play the role that it has? So I think, it, so we've asked our teachers to put as many parents as possible onto that guardian feature so that at least parents are aware and that staff are able to contact parents quite quickly. So, so what we've undertaken is to contact parents quickly the minute we see stuff isn't working the way it should. So where there's work outstanding or boys not turning up for things, uh, we'd be contacting parents uh, pretty quickly. I think what would be really helpful is if we had parents, they will know when they're sitting having dinner with their son, if they just touched base and said, you know, how's it going? And if they were to get in touch with um, either myself, I would forward it to the right place, or Aidan Smith. Aidan Smith's email is exactly the same as mine, it's just Smith and um, let us know when it's not working. Let us know when your son is getting ready for a geography assignment and he doesn't know what's going on. Um, because, I mean, in an ideal world, we'd say, well, come on, he's a grown-up boy, he must just contact his teacher. But these are not normal times. And one thing that has come back to us from all of our international contacts um, who've been in this for longer than we have, is that the initial few weeks of this online stuff, everybody is bullish and they're really happy about it. And the, you know, the, the kids are enjoying it. It's a whole novelty thing. These next few weeks are the real post honeymoon stuff where um, the, the gaps begin to show and the stress of having to do all of this um, thing in a different sort of way begins showing and so, so the, there will be cracks and, and let's not pretend that there shouldn't be or won't be um, and the way that we'll get through them is to to contact the school when you see stuff that we can't see. It's our job to to deal with it. Uh, we're not expecting you. My son came to me with a, a maths uh, problem and it, I mean I'm quite proud of how I used to be a maths teacher, but I, I was completely flummoxed. And so we're not expecting you to sit down at the dinner table doing maths unless that's your thing. But um, we, you can sit around the dinner table and figure out where the problems are and let us know. And Alan, um, a big thing on people's minds is the question of exams and specifically matrix and when those exams will be mid-year, end of year, Will they be a proper set of exams? I think you touched on that a little bit earlier, but perhaps that's, you know, the one point saying that the matric boys are stressed about this, um, you 
you know, pending exams. Yeah. So um, one thing um, one thing we're looking at is so Umalusi have said that the matric exams need to be written on the matric curriculum and that they're not going to trim back the curriculum. Whether that changes or not, we don't know, but that's what they currently say. That being the case, um, the idea of boys returning and then suddenly being thrown into prelims is problematic. So we would we would see prelims shifting a bit later. So um, for for August um, for matric students, um, I, I think if you're planning a, a holiday in August, that's probably not the best thinking. We would probably be running prelims later than we would normally run them and shifting the program later. And um, we would also, um, there is the possibility that government might declare that the matric exams run later into December. So that's been spoken about. And um, one of the one of the things that, and it's something we really are toying about, it's just a, an idea and a concept, and so I'm not making an announcement or anything, but um, there is the possibility that um, students, so some students will fly through this and get their matric and go on to university and be fine. Um, there might be some for whom that there, you know, there are, are real gaps and they just don't get the sort of grades that they had expected. And so one of the ideas we are talking about, and it really is just an idea we're talking about, is something of a, a post-matric year for next year um, to redo subjects or courses or um, just as a, as a compensatory sort of mechanism as a spare wheel, I suppose. And uh, that's stuff we're thinking about and um, testing, you know, it's still too soon, you know, you, for, for a, a boy who's done the online well and can get into university course of his choice, that would be first option. And we think if, if we think that the, the product's good enough to do that. But just as a spare wheel, it's something we are thinking about. Know how much more you're going to what time are you planning on finishing i'm planning to finish at um six o'clock but if um you know if, if we needed to go on we could um you guide me graham okay well we're three minutes to six um just a couple of other themes that are coming through um well it's building on previous themes and encouragement to the teachers to provide as much feedback as they can and perhaps it's the normal reporting um, process, but perhaps more in depth and perhaps potentially more often. So that's um, something important. Um, you know, the, then what I'm reading through all of this, Alan, is, you know, there are people and, and never in the history of, of, of certainly my life have we lived in a time of such uncertainty and that's coming through. And, you know, from the extent of people, from some people saying the boys should be coming back to school tomorrow and others much more cautious. Um, I guess throwing that into the mix, you've got the whole question of the government making you know, pronouncements about when you can and when you can't. But I guess that comes back to your risk matrix in the beginning, and you're taking all of these things into account and will continue to communicate and make it known when um, people will be coming back. And then, Alan, just um, a comment that's coming through a lot. A, a big thank you to you and a thank you to the rest of the staff for the work that they're putting in and the communication that has been in place. And, you know, so, you know, on top of the thanks, it's also, you know, um, appealing for more of these kinds of sessions and potentially sessions like this, you know, maybe in houses uh, or in, um, you know, different year groups or tutor groups or whatever the case may be. So that's just some general feedback from the group. Um, but but really, um, a big thank you to you and to the staff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, to the parents who've... Uh, so, so this was an experiment. And so um, I have a sense that we've managed to get a lot of stuff on the table and um, might not have answered every question, but you've got the, the email and the WhatsApp. And, and um, please don't worry about um, whether it's appropriate to write to the headmaster. You know, I'm, I'm good with email. I'll get back to people promptly on that. And it's a good way to communicate. So um, please feel free about that. And um, we'll certainly take whatever feedback we get from this session 
and um, do more of them across all sorts of things. So uh, thank you. And thank you very much, Graham, for, um, for your, um, your assistance tonight. I, I have a, it's worked well and it's, I, I could never have uh, had my eye on what I'm saying um, as well as um, uh, fielding all the questions. So, so thank you very much. And um, we'll be in touch as to when the next one of these will be. And um, obviously, as and when we, we know what uh, developments are happening, we'll communicate in the normal fashion as well. This, is, this doesn't replace all the normal formal communication. It's just an opportunity to, to have more direct sort of feedback. So, so thank you so much. Thank you.